and <laughs> I'm excited. I want to welcome you to Tamara's Closet Day. I'm just really excited that I've got a really, really very special guest today. This gentleman is like an internationally acclaimed recording and performing artist. He's like multi-instrumentalist. I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything he doesn't play <laughs> because he plays so many different um, instruments. It's unbelievable. But he's excellent on the keyboards, the guitar, drums, the harmonica, which I love the harmonica. He's performed with several um, legends like the Neville Brothers, Lil Bucks, uh, Senegal, Henry Gray, Paul Richel, Annie Rains, God, the list goes on, Don Mott, Jay Roberts. He has also shared the stage with NRBQ, the band, and Willie Nelson, uh, Rosie Led Ledgett, and many, many other greats. Let it. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. And many other greats. And then 2014 has he has had a role as the sound designer for KCPT's production of King Lear, which is starring a Lawrence Olivier, for which he composed and performed music, as he also did for. Um, it was actually Johnny. Um, I mean Brad Pitt's first feature film, uh, Johnny Sway. So this gentleman also has a catalog of over like 500 songs as well, and he's got a novel that has like an original soundtrack that's included, and he also told me he's got two screenplays that he is really hoping to publish. So this man is just amazing, uh, he's just multi-talented, and he's played in like over 160 shows in 2011, and he did like 290 shows, and 2012 and 196 shows in 2013. It made me tired just <laughs> learning all this and reading it. And now he's preparing his first European tour with um, TJ Concerts in Holland. And um, he, the Steve Grandinetti band he's, is, is his band. He's going to be with John Sanders on bass and special guest drummer, actually Pete DePoe of Redbone fame, will be touring in the Netherlands, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria in the spring of 2015. So, um, I, and I did want to give you his website so you can check all this out. It's at stevegrandinetti.com. Can you see that? I hope so. <laughs> And you can check out his um, schedule and calendar. And so with um, he's got his latest CD out now, that, which is what we're going to be talking about today, My American Heart. So I've got it right here. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce you to the one and only Steve Grandinetti. Well, thank you very much. Watch the sunrise from my window. Scarlet ribbon clouds flatter the sky. I love the dawn. It's the morning that makes me cry. Oh, I love you. Yes, I love you. And I will love you till the day that I die, till the day that I die, till the day that I die. Walk the sidewalks of my hometown, carbon-based life forms fill my eye, I love humanity, it's the people that make me sigh, oh I love you, yes I love you, and I will love you till the day that I die. Till the day that I die, till the day that I die. I work the music. 
music from the inside. Swirling harmonies fill my head. I love the rhythm. It's the feeling that makes me fly. Oh, I love you. Oh, yes, I love you. And I will love you till the day that I die. 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 Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I just love the harmonica, Steve, anyway. Me too. I, we were talking about that the other day when I first met you, and um, I really was tickled when you pulled that out and started playing it. That was really great. I really, <laughs> I really like it. I do. So, oh, it's so fun to be here. Thanks for having me, Tamara. I'm really, really looking forward to this. This is a really awesome, special show with a really special person doing the interviewing, and I appreciate that. Oh, you are so welcome. Uh, uh, you're here today because at Tamara's Closet, it, we're here to celebrate Steve and um, his newest CD, My American Heart, and just wanting to... Um, promote him and he's he's so he's so multi-talented and he also teaches which we will get into that but he's I, I truly believe he's such an inspiration for anyone who aspires to be a singer or songwriter or, or a musician of any sort and so um, I met Steve on Facebook uh, just recently uh, someone had um, actually referred him to me and thought that we should be Facebook friends and, and when I, you know, I realized he was a musician, I immediately asked him, you know, would he, you know, be interested in, in an interview and he graciously accepted it right away so I was just really thrilled um, that you could be here today, Steve, I really was and I really appreciate that. So I'm just... Oh, my pleasure, Tamara, my pleasure. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. So I have, I have to say, I have to ask you because I, I this is something that I always like to ask someone who's very talented is, is how how old were you when you knew you really wanted to you know sing and become a musician? I mean, how how you know how young were you? You know that's a great question, and I get asked that quite often. And I will be honest, uh, I feel uh, that I came out kind of fully developed in that way. I, I feel that as soon as I came onto this planet, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big part of my life. Well, primarily, the most important thing in my life is spirituality, which, which is the reason I even play music to begin with. And in regards to spirituality, I'm very aware of past life uh, experiences that we all have. And for me. Uh, I, I definitely, even at a very young age, was aware that um, I'd done this before. So for me, you know, I loved your questions and I read the questions and I was, it's interesting because for me, I never had a dream about being a musician. I never thought about it. I just knew I was. And so it was more about um, being raised by parents who weren't really in tune with how much I needed to get some instruments. And uh, and need to be exposed to that, um, and so you know to to really answer the question, I would say that as soon as I was born, I wanted to 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 do music, and the first thing that really uh, pulled me in was the rhythm, and so when I was about three or four years old. Uh, I kept bugging my mom for drums, and since we lived in a little apartment in New York City, that was kind of out of the question. And so she had originally had taken me uh, at that point, I think it was about four or five, to a dance studio. <laughs> and being this little uh, Italian boy, uh, seeing all these girls in tutus, I freaked out. I was like, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, was, I didn't want to be a dancer at that point. You know, I kind of resent, I kind of wish I had gone for it, but that wasn't my calling, you know, to be a dancer, even though I love to dance. 
So I don't know if the, I'm answering your question fully, but but basically I I kept I kept pushing for drums and and she finally um, allowed me to play piano and that's what started me about the age of about seven. So wow. piano was the first thing I got involved with. Wow, well that see I just think that's great. So you did. I mean you probably would wouldn't mind taking a class now with some women in tutus. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> You got that. Well, you know, the funny thing was, is I, I always say this about drummers. I think uh, a lot of us, and all musicians in general, um, you know, guy, you know, it's a primarily male-dominated field. It's changed over the years, but um, we get involved in music to get women. <laughs> I mean, I was in fifth grade. I was in fifth grade when I finally did start playing drums and drum and bugle corps. And uh, it was a big, uh, that was a big motivating factor was the girls, you know. And they do love the drummers because uh, as a drummer, we got a lot of stamina. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, the girls like the drummers. And I know that's all. But so now, were you in the marching band? Because I played, I think I told you when we talked before, um, that I had taken flute in, in high school and I was in the marching band. Is that, did your did you do that in, in high school? or? Well, Yes, because again, you know, I had this 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 strong need. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't a desire. Like I said, it wasn't like, oh, I saw some, I saw you know somebody play drums, and I was like, gee, I want to do that. No, it was like from within me, I needed to play, and so I was playing on everything I could get my hands on, pots, pans, you know, the usual drummer stuff. And in fifth grade, um, I was fortunate enough <clears throat> where the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization. Uh, started a drum and bugle corps. So, because I went to Catholic school, so we didn't have, you know, the normal public school stuff like bands and everything. So, I joined that, and all I wanted to do was drums, and of course, they put me on bugle. So, I learned how to play bugle, and then I was in the horn section for a while playing baritone horn, bass baritone horn, and the whole time I kept begging to be in the drum section. Once they allowed me to get into the drums, I went from being like the new guy to the captain of the snare line and within just a month or so. It was crazy how it just happened. It's the same thing with drum set. I remember the first time I ever played on a drum set was like 7th or 8th grade. And a friend of mine uh, in my band, I had a band and I was the keyboard player and singer. And my drummer, uh, you know, he would leave his drums at my house. And I remember the first time I sat down at a drum kit and I just played, and I could play better than he played, and he had lessons and everything, and I knew, I knew that was, you know, it's funny we're talking about drums, because it's bringing me back to what originally got me hooked on music, so it's great. <laughs> now, when you, when you were young like that, who was your, did you have, like, someone you idolized, like, who was your biggest inspiration, and maybe in that time, was it the, I'm trying, I don't know what time period that would have been, but who was, uh, was there a band or a singer that you idolized back then, or? Again, you know, having these Italian uh, parents who were first generation, you know, they were immigrant, uh, their parents were both immigrants. Um, they had a real old school philosophy. Um, I wasn't exposed to the, most of the things uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s that a lot of my peer group was. I was hearing what my mom was listening to, which was more blues, some singers, you know, Dinah Washington. So in answer to your question, no, I didn't really have... Um, again, it was internal rather than an external influence. So for me, it's always been more internal. Um, it was just me having to express my own self. I didn't really have that until later when I was, you know, in my mid to late teens. And at that point, um, you know, the, the bands that have influenced everybody from that generation, you know, the Beatles especially, the Rolling Stones a little bit. But for me, I was more um, jazz and blues. And so the first drummers that I was turned on to was like Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and Louis Belson, those guys, the old school guys. And... Um, and then eventually it was really Billy Cobham, who I give huge kudos, kudos to, um, a drummer who just blew my mind. I wanted to be Billy, I wanted to play like Billy Cobham. Um, for, he was in Mahavishnu Orchestra. He played all the jazz greats, including, you know, Miles Davis and such. Oh. And he also had a similar background because he grew up in New York and he was in drum and bugle corps like I was, you know. So there was this uh, kind of connection there. Okay. Oh wow! So, is there someone today, though, that you sort of mentor after, or um, 
you know, because I know you're more jazzy and blues. So, is there someone that you? I, as as you know, Tamara, I, as diverse as diverse as I am in my in the instruments I play, I am also in in my songwriting and in what I what I listen to and what my influences are. As I um, really got into music in my in my mid twenties, full full time. Uh, I really started to listen to a lot of music that I hadn't listened to or didn't really appreciate. And so I would say it's a wide, wide swath of people. Everybody from Bob Dylan, Bob Marley, Neil Young, um, you know, I could go on and on. The list is endless. But the, but the ones who are really affected me, uh, seeing them live for the first time is the Neville Brothers. I was uh, a young kid in a music school at Loyola University. And uh, late 70s, early 80s, I was in New Orleans, and um, seeing the Neville Brothers they blew my mind. I'd never seen anything like that, and those guys are probably the number one influence on me overall if I had to pick one group. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get to perform with them and to call you know, a couple of them my, my friends. You know? They're amazing, amazing musicians because it's not just about the music with them. It's about the transcendence and, and coming from poverty and hardship and, you know, the music industry is just, it's, it's just horrible. And what it does to people is horrible, you know, uh, and how they were able to rise above all that and, and to bring a whole level of spirituality to the world, you know, and that's what I'm about. It's not just about getting out there and getting my rocks off and being an egotistical guy. Look at how cool I am. It's about, it's about saying, hey, this is spirit that directs these these things. This is gifts that I've been given by the divine energy that I want to share with people to inspire them to find their own calling and their own you know level of, uh, of what they can express in the world. So rather than following others it's more about c coming in contact with who you really are. Right. Well I think that's great and I noticed I noticed you had a lot um, some things about the Grateful Dead on your on your Facebook page was they're another they're another one I can't leave them out I got to see the Grateful Dead I didn't get into the dead until much later in my life and um, I was fortunate enough to go and see a bunch of shows I did get to see Jerry Garcia Jerry Garcia is another guy that is like a huge influence on me not necessarily as a guitarist I never try to play his licks I love the songwriting of the Grateful Dead I mean Robert Hunter is one of the greatest lyricists right up there with Bob Dylan uh, Neil Young and people like that in my in my opinion uh, what I loved about the Dead was the camaraderie and um, the the spirit, the group. You know, it, it, the whole Deadhead experience is great. I I'm personally a guy who, uh, <laughs> to use a quote from uh, Woody Allen, um, which I think is originally from Groucho Marx, is I've never been somebody who uh, wants to belong to any group that would have me as a member. So I'm not your typical Deadhead. I'm not a follower per se. I like to do my own thing, but I did enjoy being in that experience. Right, yeah. Now I know that when I was in college I dated a guy that he and some of his friends really, you know, were deadheads or whatever you call them back then. Yep. I, I never, I mean, and that was really my only experience with the Grateful Dead. But um, but it, it was, there was a lot of people that, that I was surrounded by that were followers followers of the Grateful Dead. But now, did you? Were you said your parents? It was kind of a you were. It was more strict. Were they musicians at all? Did any were any of them musically inclined at all? Either of your parents? No. no um. Both of my grand. Excuse me. Both my grandfathers uh, played some guitar and um, had some musical aptitude. But my parents, they loved music. Um, and they listened to music, and they were dancers. They used to put music on. I remember when I was a real little kid, I'd watch. They, when they were happy, and they'd put on music and dance around the living room. But my mom especially was really the one who, um, you know, just loved listening. And uh, as I said, Dinah Washington and, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, all those great blues and jazz singers, that was her favorite stuff to listen to. Um, and, and, you know, I have to say, too, even though they were Italian, they didn't, Unlike some cultures who come to this country, the Italians tend to uh, assimilate into the American culture. So she didn't teach me Italian. She didn't give me a super Italian first name, you know. And uh, 
she didn't force a lot of Italian music on me, you know, traditional music on me. Although my poor little brother did have to learn accordion, so he did get a little bit more than I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, now, I was always thankful I didn't get to play accordion. I don't know why, but. <laughs> How were you impacted by the 80s when the disco started, when it was so really, really big? Was that, what did you feel about that? Because that's when, not anything like good. your music. You know, like I said, that's kind of when I came up. That's when I was in, you know, I was in my 20s in the 80s, and um, I was really, that's when I was starting my musical career. Um, you know, disco. I'll, I'll say I, I agree with uh, I agree with Mick Jagger's statement about disco. It's just the four on the floor, as we call it. It's just the bass drum going boom, boom, boom. I mean, that's all it really is. You know, the hi hat is going. I'll be right back. Don't go away, everybody. I'll give you a little disco, okay? Hang on. You can't see me, but basically, all the disco is doing is you know. So you know, it's not. It's not, you know, it's not a religion. It's not a, it's not a, it's not an occult or anything. It's just, a, it's just another form of music. Yeah. Um, it had no impact on me. I'm not. I was never, you know, I've never been, you know, the cocaine uh, guy, you know, going. And I was, I was really. That's a big part of it too. Is the whole cocaine culture came up during that period. And I remember my friends who would be caught up in that. And I, basically, um, I just like if there's good music, I don't really care what genre it's in and there's some good disco tunes I mean there really is it's not something that really had any impact on me though in the big picture if that answers the question I pretty much dropped out in the 80s and was was be, was reliving the 60s which I had missed so for me it was more about going back and checking out all this music that you know was just that just kind of passed me by and I really that's what I got more into I was in the 80s, I was living in the 60s, so the disco didn't have much impact on me. <laughs> yeah, well, the disco was just, I mean, you got to miss great music to dance to, but that, and that's really what that was about. But right. when you said the 60s, and, you know, it's funny, when I was listening, you know, when I've been listening to your CD, The American Heart, there, there, I had this feeling of the, it felt like, um, you know, even though I was just a baby then, you know, it felt like to me sort of, I guess it reminded me of what music would have been back in the 60s, so just a little bit, like it has a little bit of flair from that. Do you feel that way a little bit? It's well, sure. I, you know, I usually get called 70s music. I've been, I've had posters made where I'm performing and it's like Steve Grandinetti, 70s music, you know, and I'll take that as the ultimate compliment for me personally. Um, I think so. To me, I don't think, I don't think music is, has been as, as quite as good and, and creative and explosive and, and dangerous, you know, and uh, just amazing. I mean, when you go back to the, when we're talking 60s and 70s, we're talking, you know, everything from the Beatles to the Doors to, to the Stones to Bob Marley to reggae to, it's just amazing to me. I mean, and when we, when we talk about uh, African American music at that point, R and B. I mean, real old school R and B. You know, oh, yeah. Motown. You know, that's the stuff I love. I mean, all this. There's just so much music I love from that period. And yeah, I would say that that's what defines not just how I play or how I write, but how I record the music and the instruments that I use. I use vintage instruments. Yeah. Uh, I don't use synthesizers. You that's, know, that's so I play all instruments from that period. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's good. Vintage. I was looking for the word. That's probably a good word to describe your your music more like. It is sort of vintage, which is I agree because I know I had this conversation years ago um, when I was married at the time. My husband and I at the time talked about how the music was changing and how it just wasn't that we didn't like it, but it just it's never been the same as it was in the seventies, you know. And and you know it really has. I don't know. It's just like it's totally different, you know. So I agree with you on well, that. It, it's that time period too. I, I was on the radio yesterday here at our local station KPTZ with um, with disc jockey Phil Rome, and he was saying that too. That you know that the, the the love, the energy of vibration, which was a higher vibrational level, which we are feeling the ripples now again. You know, and whether it's um, spirituality, the New Age movement, you know. Uh, the musical, I mean, there's still, all of that stuff is still with us. I mean, even computers, you know, if it was, I mean, I, 
you know, we're, we're not here to talk about drugs, but when you talk about drugs today, you know, versus then, LSD was opening people's minds. You know, it wasn't so much about, like, by the disco era, it was more about let's just get messed up and let's party and get out of our heads. It was more like let's increase our, our awareness, not let's diminish our awareness. And we've come, you know, through the 80s, it was kind of a, a darkening of the light. And I think it was a reactionary moment to the 60s and 70s, which was like, Let's love each other. And I'm not saying those were perfect times. There was a lot of bad things that happened, of course. Yeah. But you can, see, you can see that the Illuminati, or whatever you want to call it, the dark forces in this universe, were really working to kill off all the good people, like John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And, and, and I'm sure, I, I don't know, but I bet a lot of the musicians that went down were also part of that. They, you know, look at John Lennon. We were talking about influences on me. How can I leave him out? He is probably the number one influence above everyone else because the day that he died I was in New York City and I I remember it was you know it was around 11 o'clock at night and I heard on the radio and I and I immediately went into Manhattan to be with everybody else at that point with the vigil and I said to myself from this point on music is all I'm gonna do I'm not gonna do anything but music I mean his death really inspired me to 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 go for it and and John Lennon's music and his lyrics and his whole persona with what he did with Yoko is just, I'm trying to carry that tradition on. You know, let's say yes, yes. instead of no. You know, yes to peace, yes to love, yes to the fact that, you know, all these, all these mind control manipulations of people over, the, over thousands of years are, are coming to an end. You know, the dinosaur is wagging its tail and it's causing a lot of problems, but it's going down. And I'm really hoping for... For, for more enlightenment again. Because that's what the 60s and 70s were. It was like the enlightenment period, you know? Yeah, it was. And, you know, it was the, you know it was all about love and peace. And, and that was when marijuana was so big. And then, you're right, when the 80s came, cocaine was the new, the new drug. And so that was like a just, it's almost like the music jacked up, you know? Right. right drug did, you know, but the the mellowness of the the love and the peace and the marijuana area era is just, you know, it's to, it's a totally different message is, is what it is. And I don't know what it's moving into today because, you know, it's um and I wonder I'm interested in now that they're legalizing marijuana in so in so many as they do that, if the if the music's gonna change and make a shift with, I don't know. You know. I don't either. That's a very good. That's a really good point. I'm, I um, yeah. I mean, marijuana has has been a part of my life too. In in terms of, uh, you know, I think musicians in general. I mean, it's just being honest here, you know. And it is legal here in Washington State, which is amazing. Um, I I can't even tell you what an amazing feeling it is to not be a criminal anymore for for using a plant, medicinal plant. Um, and we're starting to see that it, it can heal just about everything. And, it, and it, really, it, it really is a great thing. But for artists and musicians, I think it's been an integral part of music for, for forever. I mean, going back to Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, you know, he, he's known for smoking pot every day of his life, you know. I, I think it really is the nonverbal side, and it opens you up. Uh, and music is, you know, is such a, a magical you know, language, um, you know, I just, I think it's great, and I think you're right, it'll be interesting to see how it does, you know, change um, music again, if it, if it has an impact on it or not. I think it already has, I think it's already there, you know. Right. It, well, who, I think it's already happening. Who have you got, who would you say has, in, well, you did say, um, is it, like, the biggest impact in your life, I mean, would, would you said mention John Lennon and um, definitely John Lennon would be the biggest. But is if I had to pick one, it would be John Lennon. But as far as is there someone in your life that's impacted it, your life that's not even necessarily a musician, impacted it, and sort of just from the standpoint of, of going after your dreams or someone who's you've mentored after, and it does even if it's not in. Um, a musician, maybe it's a friend or a family member. Is there someone like that? That's there's, there's several people like that. I would say, you know, I would have to say that my my mom, you know, Gloria um, Grandinetti, she 
<laughs> you know, she's a, she was a funny person. She she gave me she gave me piano lessons, bought a piano. Um, she helped me go to Manhattan School of Music when I was a kid. I got a scholarship to go to Manhattan School of Music, Prep Division, uh, which you know meant that she had to drive me. Um, and my dad gets credit too because he was the guy that helped me get my first drum set. Um, took me to all those practices for drum and bugle corps. Took me to my, when I was just my first band. I was 12, so you got to have a parent that's going to drive you to your gigs. Um, ironically, a little side note: when I was 12, I was getting paid the same amount of money for a gig as I am now. So that tells you how screwed up everything is in the music industry for us musicians. Um, but let's go back to that. That's a great question, Tamara, because I, I find that. Go ahead. Your dad was someone that was, he was very supportive then. Well, that's, I don't really want to get into my parents too much because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there and um, I don't want to give them too much credit because they, they were there, but there was a lot of negative stuff too and I don't, I don't want to really get into that today. Um, but what I want to say about my mom is she was the one that didn't want me to be a musician and went out of her way to make sure I wasn't going to be a musician. Um, my goal was... I think when I realized that that's all I wanted to do was probably around 12, 13 years. When that 12 to 14, those were the years where I was like, all I want to do is play music professionally. She had other plans. She wanted me to become a doctor, a lawyer, and then later, after I was successful, <laughs> I could play music on the side. And so that was a clash and that was a conflict that we had because I was the first person in my family to graduate high school, the first person to go to college, the first person to get a bachelor's degree, and then the only person to get a master's degree. So she made sure that I was highly educated. And, and to be honest with you, all that education is great, but it really took me away from the early years that I could have been focused on music. And so um, for those, and I know your show is about inspiring people, and I want to say to people, no matter what path you're on, you, you know, once you find where you need to be, don't let things like time or you know, or, or regret ever get in the way because I, you know, I didn't really go back fully, fully onto music until I was in my late twenties, and I had people tell me, "You're too old. You're never going to make it." Blah blah blah. I mean, always the negative people are around you, and so my mom was an influence, but she was also a negative influence because if she really had been supportive and supported my music, I would, you know, probably have had a lot more success and not have to struggle and kind of come in the back door as I did. But one of the people that I want to give some a shout out to is is a friend of mine in the Philippines, uh, Ella Tuliao, and Ella, who you've uh, you've friended her as a matter of fact, she you've been using her pictures. Uh, she bought all my CDs and she's been really oh, yeah. yeah, Ella Ella is Ella is sort of like my muse. You know, we we've never met in person, but she is someone I spend a lot of time with talking online. And there's something about our energy and her energy in particular that inspires me. Uh, she's been really inspirational to me. Um, I don't know exactly, you know, we'll get on like this online and I'll, I'll start playing and I, I don't know what it is. It's her energy is very supportive. So I give her a big shout out for being someone who's like a muse right now. Um, you know, I'm not in any kind of specific relationship or anything. I, I would say that she's my muse right now and I really, I really honor that because you do have to have muses, you know, that are real people. Yeah, you do, and that's great. I, I I do know who you're talking about. That's I think that's awesome. So I have to ask you though, what in, in your new CD, My American Heart, um, what 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 is the inspiration behind this? What what is your message behind this? Um, great question. And I you know I I was thinking about that um, when you were asking me that. I, I will say that what's happened with me is as a self produced self producing independent artists, I have all these songs that I'm trying to get done, which means I have to record them and mix them and do all that work and then self-produce them, which is, you know, costs money and it's time consuming. And that is why the past three CDs that I've done are chock full of songs. You know, there's 20 songs on each one of these because I'm just trying to get all the songs out. So the point of this is that the prior CDs before it, which was, you know, was more about just getting things out, didn't have necessarily cohesive thematic presence. This one I wanted to be, um, and it's because I wrote this song, and the song came to me um, all at once, My American Heart, and I recorded it in one take. The first time I wrote it was just the first take that I did it, and um, which is what I used on there, 
and it's just about where we're at as a as a race and as a, you know as a country right now. I feel that that we've definitely uh, we're in a place where we're you know it's a declining time for the United States. I think we've lost a lot of our good qualities. I think we're seen by the rest of the world as weakened and uh, less than we are. I mean, when, when you know, with John F. Kennedy, we were like the heroes of the world. You know, we were out there helping people, and now we've become. You know, it's almost as though we've been <laughs> sucked into the Borg or somehow. We've become the enemy. And even in our own country, I mean, we have the most amount of people incarcerated. And I could go on and on, and I don't want to get, I don't want to sound negative because wherever there's death, there is life. And wherever there is decline, there is increase as well. So this, My American Heart, is my attempt to express one person's feelings about, you know, I'm only a second generation. You know, I tell people this all the time. You know, I, I know people that they came over on the on the you know the Mayflower. Okay, I've only been my people, my family's only been here for less than a hundred years, which is a drop in the in the bucket. And so, based on that, I have a different view of this world, you know, of America, because my grandparents came here on a boat and suffered, and they thought, you know, the, the streets were paved with gold, and found out, no, they're going to be digging those ditches and putting in the sewers in New York City. There's no gold there. And so here I am, and I understand my mom, who wanted me to be a professional. She wanted me to not have to struggle. And in her eyes, being a musician would be a step back. Um, and so I love this country. You know, people mistake, you know, us supposed hippies or, or people who are radical thinkers or, you know, question things, when in fact that is really being a real uh, patriot is what's the real deal here. So for me, it's this is my expression about, um, you know, what what is going on. And, you know, this is a perfect time for me to play that song for you. I think yeah. I should do that right now. I don't know why, but I thought that was a transition right into it. And this is my American heart. Floating time and space, specks of dust, human race, losing face in the global eye, society deep decline, and it breaks my American heart. Breaks my American heart. Breaks my American heart. To watch my country fall apart. Watch our country fall We're drowning in our decline, totally ignoring the divine. Worried minds bring rampant fear, drawing disaster ever near, and it breaks my American heart. Breaks my American heart. Breaks my American heart. To see this country torn apart. Watch my country torn apart. Running out of time. Dying on the vine, seven swords remind, our fears are of our mind, running out of time, we're dying on the vine, seven swords remind, all fears are of the mind, and it breaks my American heart. 
breaks my American heart. Breaks my American heart. To watch my country fall apart. To watch my country fall apart. To watch our country fall apart. All right, thank you. Thanks, Dee, so much. That was perfect. Sometimes the music is better than anything I can say. You know, the words don't, you know, the music speaks for itself. And Yeah, well, I can hear it in all your, all your songs on this CD. I could, that's why I wanted to know where it was coming from. Now, i, I got to ask you, I, I want to talk about something, and that's your teaching, because I would imagine that's that's something very rewarding for you, and I know that... I always think it's really great when someone um, wants to teach. It's sort of like a, a way to give back. And when you become an expert at something and you want to teach and you give back, it, it's just, it's a, it's, to me, it's very admirable. And I wanted to talk about what that means to you and, 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 and what, your, what your thoughts are on that, actually. You know. you know, you're such a great interviewer. You really are. I just got to tell you, because you you were able to help me pull everything together. This ties in. This is interesting. I hadn't thought of this until you asked me that. When I was real little, when I was like six, seven, when people asked me what I wanted to be, I always said I wanted to be a teacher. Okay, now that's interesting considering that music was this predominant thing. But I've always been an intellectual as well. Always been a super, you know, reader. I was, I spoke very young. I, I was, I, I've always been a super smart person, and and uh, and so you know, teaching is is one of those things when you're able to master things, you want to share it. You know, it makes sense. And so I started teaching music when I was when I was twelve. To, to the kids in the neighborhood, and even my parents. I remember when I started learning, you got me excited here. I started learning my, learning my rudimental drumming, and I'd come home, and I was like, I had my, my mom and my brother and my dad sitting at the table, and I'd be teaching them, and I was always a teacher like that. I'd always be, I was always able to express things and, and make it easier for people to understand. And as someone who's had a lot of education and a lot of teachers, I've only had a, a handful of really exceptional teachers. Um, you know, Mrs. I'm going to throw some names out there. I mean, Mrs. Adams from the fourth grade, one of the greatest teachers I ever had, turned me onto the library. Just a wonderful person. God rest her soul. Um, and Jerry Lopatin, who's who's still with us. Uh, what an amazing teacher, amazing musician. I was fortunate enough to have him teach me steel drums, and then I took over teaching the steel drums when I was just a 15, 16 year old kid um, at that point in New York and um, you know he was one of those teachers who was able to take, I only had him for a year for piano lessons, you know I've only really basically had a year of piano lessons in my whole life oh. and most of it's, and, and, and I'm a teacher to myself, see so even though I went to Juilliard and I had school music, I had to like kind of erase a lot of stuff and re-teach myself which is true if you really want to learn anything you got to teach yourself and so I would say that, that is my philosophy as a teacher, uh, mm -hmm. is to teach the person how to teach themselves. Because really, all that information is there. All the information is there. It's more about having someone as a leader, or I mean, lead you through the, the jungle of, of so much stuff. How do you focus on what's important? And so, you know, I've been teaching, as you can imagine, a very long time. And I, you know, all through, I mean, my whole life, I've been teaching on the side. It's never been a, a formal thing. I've never been a formal uh, you know, school teacher per se, but I've taught, I'm going to share, let's talk about teaching. When I was in New Orleans, I needed some extra money. I was teaching Sunday school. <laughs> I was teaching, I've taught, you know, I've taught steel drums at a camp. I've taught, um, you know, I was a music uh, counselor at camps for, you know, when I was in college, you know, to make some bucks. And so I was teaching little kids music. And I've always been a private teacher, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I have to be honest, you know, uh, there were periods where I didn't really do a lot of teaching. You know, the 80s was more where I was really woodshedding and working on my music and just trying to break into the industry. Through the 90s, I started getting pulled in a little bit more. I, I founded a program in Vermont where I was for a brief period at the Long Trail School. I, was, I started a music program there. Loved it, loved it. Um, and one of the things I love to do besides the one-on-one -on -one of teaching instruments, because I play a lot of instruments, so I teach drums, bass, guitar, everything is putting kids in, in ensembles to get them to play together because anytime you play with others 
you learn so much more than just practicing by yourself. And it wasn't until I moved out west here to Port Townsend that I got inundated with students. You know, I came out to the west coast to really promote the music and really get into it, and I ended up, I feel that, I feel that the creator brought me here to be like an inseminator of musical information to a whole generation of kids. So I've been here 15 years, and those first kids that I taught were, you know, between 14 and 18. So they're, they're adults now, you know, young adults. And I will say that the, what happened here it was, it was miraculous. There was a period of time between about 2001 and 2008 where I was inundated with so many students. I had over 50 students a week that I was teaching privately. 50 students a week. That's, that's you know, a lot of time for prepping and teaching. And I had over 10 ensembles of kids that I was teaching in different bands. I had like a 16-piece jazz group, and I had a 12-piece R&B group, of horns, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would, we staged all kinds of shows. And I'm rambling on because I do get excited about the teaching. No, I can tell you're very passionate about it, and that's great. Now, do you see some of your students today as, that you taught when they were young? Do you still have contact with them? Do they know what you're – do they follow you today? Or? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, just today, one of my former students, Michael Crozier, who is – uh, we'll talk about Michael for a second. Um, he's now like a manager at the Guitar Center in Seattle. When I when Michael started coming, he was a, he was one of these really talented kids who was a dancer and a break dancer, really really a hip kid. And he learned a little bit of guitar and a little bit of piano and a little bit of singing and a little bit of drums. And now he's like a rapper. He's got a whole career and he's really successful. He's really really excellent at what he does. And that's just one of of hundreds and thousands of th literally thousands of kids. I would say 90% of my students have gone professional with music, which is un which is pretty unusual. And I would say all of them continue to play music in their life, whether it's just for a hobby or not. Very few of my students have given up music. They stick with it and um and you know I'm I'm unusual in in, in everything I do. I admit that. In, in, as a teacher as well, very few people teach play as many instruments as well as I do, which is just honesty. It's not bragging. It's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sitting there practicing, you know. Um, and so I think that that's what's great is I have a lot of bass players, guitarists. Um, you know, I think my number one uh, most popular or most famous is, uh, is the guitar player, um, uh, you know, for, for a jam band out of Vermont. And um, Scott, his name's Scott Tournay. And, uh, you know, so there's like, it goes on and on. I could go on and on, but I don't want to go off on a whole lot of tangents. But, um, yeah, it's really thrilling to see them grow up. I'm excited about just, I don't have hardly as many students as I used to. The economy has been so rough the yeah. past years that people don't have money for lessons. And um, I'm excited about the few students I have. I've got some really great, amazing, talented young people. And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you one of the things that's kept me young um, is working with young people over the years because they they their energy is so wonderful and they keep me informed on what's happening for their generations and I think that's been a big part of keeping me young because I'm constantly with younger people they have so much to share you know yeah I love being <laughs> around younger people they do they do keep you young now Pete DePoe of Redbone I know you're really excited about him and oh his Pete is I just, I just spoke with Pete this morning. We've become really excellent friends. It was one of those things where I reached out to him on LinkedIn, and um, and he's you know, on tour with you, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He he wants to play. Well, it's because I wanted to play with him. He was looking for musicians. I I, I gotta I gotta interject here about this. This is where we're at. This is what I'm talking about with America and the world right now, and just how messed up our values are. When we toss away people of value, when we do not respect the elders of the tribe, when someone like that, this, listen, it's not a because he, we shouldn't be, here's the other thing I get pissed about, okay? I, I'm not about worship, hero worship, or, oh, you're famous, so that means something. That means nothing to me. What matters is substance, you know? And here's a man who, who like, you know, he was in a big band, you know, it was a Native American band in the 70s. They had that big hit, Come and Get Your Love, which is, getting a revival in this movie, Guardians of the Galaxy. But what's really impressive is 
here's a guy that started his own style called King Kong drumming, which is this really, I could get into the technical aspects of it, but it's this funky, with drums it's about four-way independence. You know, drums is like, you know, drummers get, oh, they're dumb and they're drummer, you know. No, man, it's the hardest thing to do because you can't think when you're playing because you're doing four different things at one time. And if you're really good, I mean, if you just want to play simple, you can. But if you're really syncopated, you know, like the drummer from, from the Neville Brothers or um, Mean Willie Green or the drummer from the Meters, these kind of people, you know, uh, that are just amazing and the ability to mix up each one of their limbs, you know. So Pete's one of those guys that did that in rock, popular rock music, which is, is amazing, you know. Meanwhile, here he is, he's still a young man, you know, and yet he's having a hard time finding people to play with or, or finding quality people to play with. And I just reached out to him because I, you know, I respect my elders, I respect my teachers, and I consider anyone I've ever listened to on an album or seen in concert as a teacher. You know, I, you take something from every experience. So oh, Pete and I have become good friends because of the internet, and uh, we're dying to play together. And it's going to happen. You know, um, it's you know we talk about drums because I'm also a drummer, but he's he wants to play with me, and we're going to be calling it Steve Grandinetti Band featuring Pete DePoe of, of uh, Redbone. Yep. So that's the plan. And then you've got your tour coming up. So that well, now that I, um that was okay. I think you were reading off of one of my older bios, and things have upgraded since then. And I'm sorry about that if the information wasn't correct. Uh, I'm not working with that original booking agent because he became a kind of a difficult person and um, just kind of a low low energy, low level energy person. And I would rather deal with people who have more of a higher energy. And I found a, a woman named Lily Hong in uh, Berlin, Germany, who is who is setting up the tour. So it's not going to happen until the end of this year, but it's happening. And um, I, I will be connecting with Pete because he's in Holland, and uh, we'll figure it all out one step at a time. So um, there you have it. Oh, so what, what would you tell a young a, a person that was wanting, who's a, an aspiring songwriter, musician, how to how to get started? Like, how, how do they cut their first CD, you know? How do, how do they do that? Well, my first advice is this, and I, I, um, I will say, when I teach music, I... One of the aspects, and this ties in a little bit, when my kid, when a kid comes in for one-on-one -on -one with me, say he's going to learn bass, well, he's lucky because his teacher is not just a bass player, but is a multi-instrumentalist. So while he's playing bass, I will play drums with him, which is what a bass player needs to do is lock in with the drummer. Or say it's a, it's a drummer, and drummers, they take lessons. They don't get to play with other players until they're a little older. My kids get to play with me. I'll play bass with them or guitar or keyboards, and so they get that aspect. So... What I wanted to say is, unless you feel it so deep in your soul that you have to do it, I do not play music because it's cool. I don't do things because other people do it, and I want to be like them. you got to feel it in your soul. If it is something that's burning, and you have to do it, then do it. Otherwise, if there's even a question about why you're doing it, don't go for it. It's too much work. It's too much work for too little return, and only a very tiny portion of of the people in the enter entertainment industry, as you know, make any kind of money to live. The rest of us, it's a struggle, and that's fine. You know, and, and I think that's part of because I was primarily a jazz drummer. And if you're a jazz musician, <laughs> you're not making money unless you're a really, you know, there's only a few jazz players who really made it big and, and do make it big. And I know some amazing musicians in my life who... You know, there's like myself. We're still struggling to survive. You know, but we will never be able to quit playing music. Um, so my answer is, how do you do? Make a CD and all that. I what I think is, too many young people are want to just make everything happen right away and don't want to pay any dues. You know, I think you got to pay your dues. I think you got to practice and learn music. I am so tired. I'm on a tirade now, so you're gonna let me go. I am so tired of musicians who calling themselves musicians and they don't even know how to read music. They don't understand music theory. If I said, what's the cycle of fifths, they have no clue. To me, that is just horrible. I think you're better off learning what is exactly what is music. Learn about it. Study it. And now you have so many ways to do that. So yeah. there's no excuse anymore, you know? 
Well, with with the, the world of the internet now, we have the world at our fingertips. I think that's that's given people so much so much more opportunity than you know we've ever had in our past. So I'm a big um, advocate of going after your dreams, and because of the fact that we do have access to people all over the world, that to me, if you are willing to put in the time and put in the effort and do your own research. You know, I, I believe you can do anything that your heart desires, but you do have to do the work. You do have to, um, and and you find people to mentor with, and and I think that's I think that's powerful. People have we live in such a wonderful time, I believe, with with the internet today because we can now we can meet people all over the world, just like I met you, uh, literally on social media. So it's you know we have access. To to exposure and if you learn how to market online and market yourself online you can really really um, put the power behind your pr promotion in, in a whole new way in this world that we never had you know when we didn't have the internet I mean we really do I think this is such an exciting time to actually you know go after your dreams because we do have access to you know so much that we didn't before you know you really didn't you really didn't but well, you so have to do a lot more work and I think that's what's happened is it's making it easier and so people are taking more shortcuts I mean back in my day you'd have to go to the library and study you'd have to go and find records you know CDs yeah. now like my my young guy last night Max I was teaching he's 11 and I gave him a list of drummers to listen to and he can just boom pop it right on there and he's checking out all this music it's fantastic so but I also you know there's always the good and bad with everything I think on the other side um, it's it's hurting the music industry and it's because uh, like a lot of people just want the stardom they think it's an easy buck and so you're, you, we've got this flooding of just a lot of me mediocre music out there of people that aren't really seasoned yet and haven't learned and that's fine too but it, is it really what we want when you can't wait when you've got to wade through thousands and thousands you don't know what's good or not good and so we're, we're hopefully this will come around that somehow we'll figure out how the music industry will reinvent itself because right now there is really no music industry as we know it it's uh, it's it's quite it's just really in flux and I think that happened a hundred years ago too I mean you know we're talking about music here and the music that we're talking about has been influenced, you know, by some negative things in life, like slavery and and uh, you know the slaves that came to America and how that whole music blues, which then birthed everything that we have today. And it's only been a hundred years. Yeah. When you think that a hundred years in the big picture, it's nothing, you know. So I think that I think in answer, but going back to the to young people. I am definitely supportive of anyone. When I find anyone who's serious about learning and learning music, I think the focus should be on learning and becoming the best you can, and the rest will take care of itself. Oh, sure. I think too many of the kids are focused only on the superficial aspects, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm old school in my thinking, as you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's all right. Because you want to substance, you know, you want to build the foundation before you, you get, that's why you have these kids, they, they get there and they're big hit singers, we won't mention any names, Justin Bieber, and then there's no substance to them, their whole life is just total emptiness and what kind of an influence is that on other kids? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, you've got a talent, but if you don't work with your talent and, and respect it, knowing that it's from something higher than your ego self, then you're just a destructive force. Then, then it becomes something negative and you know, music's powerful and it can be used for good or bad. There's no question. Yeah, for sure. Music is just another way we express ourselves. So um, we're going to have to wrap it up here, but I wanted, did you want to play one more song before we go? I, wanted, I want everyone to know how, how to get your CD. Is it just get your... Um, you can get that on iTunes, CD Baby. Um, you can get it from me. Anybody that wants an autographed copy like Tamara got, and you're nearby, I will ship it to you. Uh, you know, Ella and Gerlinda and many of my fans on Facebook have had them send. I will send it to anywhere in the United States if you prefer to get it directly from me. Contact me at the website or Facebook or anywhere where I am on the Internet. If you go to my website, you can see all the links. Um, and I, I was thinking about instead of playing a song um, uh, live, I was going to maybe play one off the CD. Um, and if that's okay. Yeah. 
And I wanted because this one is one that I really like a lot. Um, and this is called "Like a Buffalo," and it's one of it's my first spoken word song. Satisfied in a choir whose prayers remain unbidden. Forgive me for feeling out loud these tears in my weary eyes. I cannot hide the pain I feel for those who still believe the lies. Like a buffalo, I watch my people die to a future that's built on the lie. A man moves the earth and the sky when he is but a flower that too must die. Like a buffalo, I graze the prairies of my mind, chewing on the thoughts that I find. Some of remnants of a past left behind. Ancient echo come back to remind. All of these strings ling and in the jet stream, dreaming up the ways with my beautiful daydream. My face elastic from the hand pressure drastic. Plastic people with views that are Jurassic. You know, living without giving. It's just a sinning, loving without caring. It's just a sinning, being without sharing. It's just a sinning, beginning with separation from your mother's inside. On your journey from that place on the other side. Apart from all that you're part of, you're just drowning in a puddle of acid rain. Your mind is stained. Too many days and nights filled with nothing but the ending. And it takes the pictures on my mind's wall, faded in peace, no peace, no peace. Gee, somebody can be alive. I can't be drinking in these things that I'm thinking. Like a buffalo, I watch my people die. To a future that's built on this lie. That man rules the earth and rules the sky. But when he's but a flower that turns to So how does a man with a heart full of love rise above? Afraid that his way made it fade like a Las Vegas mark. Energy is all that there is. Call it what you will. Still, I feel for all I see and know. Whether it's show or blows away like snow on a roof or on a wind in winter day. I do believe my name is G. The man without a family or a country. No place to call home except inside this colonial dome where I hang my hat and bang away every day and every way. I'm trying to make something for you to stay. I'm trying to make something for you to stay. While time is evaporated, body electric unplugged, dissipated like an audience captivated, death is overrated, and the children of the sun are created. By mind shut down by greed, and violent yields, no matter how we appeal, we are subjected to ignorance, never so insistent to reveal. So the mundane continues to reign over the world for a while longer, making us stronger. My spirit longs to soar above the tree line of the state that's built on greed. And see, which is fear that always lingers near, leaving a curve of fear that will be real. So take your place on the wheel and let it roll, because you never know until you die. The mysteries hidden from our eyes and the true secrets that lie beyond our role in this cosmic play. Hey, remember, no matter what they say, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Spirit can never die. The spirit can never die. Spirit can never die. Spirit can never die.
Like a buffalo, I watch my people die. The future that is built on the lie. The man rules the earth and the sky. When he is but a flower, when he must die. There you oh have my. it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much, Steve. You Thank you. That was Thank a you. from American Heart. And you can get that at stevegrandanddaddy.com if you can see this up here. That is so awesome. Yeah. And that is so cool. I want to thank you again, Steve. We're going to have to wrap it up. I want to thank you so much for um, doing this with me today and being here today. And, and um, make sure that you follow, go to Steve's um, website and check out his calendar of events and you can um, he's got he's on reverb verb nation and you had all kinds of links on your website I saw so um, thanks again Steve I really enjoyed having you here today and thanks for entertaining us too your music's great and I'm excited for you and you're, we're gonna have to stay in touch and do this again I'd love to do it I was thinking the same thing there's more we didn't get to discuss so maybe we'll do another show yeah, we will. We will. You're, you're a fantastic interviewer. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure today. Thank totally. You. I'm so glad. My point of the week for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun. So make sure you stay tuned to Tamara's Call. That um, next, my next interview is going to be with a best-selling author, Walter B. Biondi, of the Promiscuous Puppeteers. Wow. You yeah. turned me on to him, and I was checking him out, and he is fascinating. Don't miss that. That is going to be yeah. great, everybody. Make sure you watch and listen to him. I will be there watching and listening, too. Yeah, he has an amazing story. So um, yes. stay tuned for that, and follow my blog, TamarasCloset.com. And Steve, thanks again, and make sure you get your CD, um, American Heart, and that's at SteveGrandandDaddy.com. And I look, and I'll have the links in the video replay too, and, and in my blog. I'll have an article about Steve in the blog, so you can follow up with that. All right. Mwah. It sounds great, and I'll, I'll I'll talk to you soon, Steve. Okay, we sure will. We'll be in touch. Thank you again, Tamara. Thank All you. the best to you. All right. Well, thanks. Keep up the good work. Fantastic job. Mwah. Lots of love, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>